Good evening. I'm Naira Renault with my new series of lectures in Health Law. Now, the first question you will probably have for me is why I'm doing this? Why to attend my lectures if there are so many Ivy League law schools across the country with sterling professors of law who are officially paid to think and to share? I will suggest five reasons. Number one, my lectures are free, for now at least. Of course, nothing free must necessarily be good. In fact, what we get free in life is mostly not good enough. But there is a second reason. My lectures are agenda free. I am not paid to play. I do not have a sponsor, grantor, employer, or commander or ideologist in chief. Further, I present original knowledge. Next, you will be attending lectures in health law provided by a person who has worked as a practicing physician at the patient's bed day and night, who has also served as a public health organizer, has independently conducted scientific studies and published in reputable journals, has presided as a judge, and who also has a law degree with a major in health law. Lastly, not all the law schools have advanced and distinct curricula in this field. The knowledge in health law is usually scattered in torts, contracts, intellectual property law, and such. Not every law school has a separate course in healthcare law. My law school, Sidon Hall Law, is a private university co-founded by the Vatican City, the Roman Catholic Church. Founding it in 1856, Bishop James Roosevelt Bailey named the school after his aunt, Sister Elizabeth Ann Seddon, the first American-born saint. However, during my studies, I established that my school is more irreligious and apolitical than any other secular law school I know. The courses in health law are simply outstanding. In addition to offering international programs in Egypt and Italy, Sitan Hall Law also participates in the Court of Justice of the European Communities in Luxembourg. I hope I managed to convince you. Now, this is an introductory video, and I must attune you up front that it will last over an hour, for about 80-85 minutes. So I suggest you prepare your sandwich in advance. Today we do not have a special topic of discussion. I will talk about the general concept of health law. Presentation of specific topics, as listed on my webpage, will follow soon, each topic at a time. Now, health and law. Let's put these two words together. Do they produce a meaning? Does a combination of these two words associate your mind with something realistic or measurable? As you know, in law every comma matters, each hyphen matters, and the words must be selected with extreme alertness so together they would generate a reason or logic. Typically, in the invented disciplines such as public health policy, we observe too much of word salads. These guys seem to be less grounded as they just adore exercising loud words, the meaning of which they barely understand themselves. Law is different. In the law you cannot use word sprinkles. You must cook the words together to produce a meaning. So what is health law? Can we define it and how? Ask this question to a layman and the response could be health law preserves my right to be healthy or my right to be sick or the right to receive an appropriate medical care. We shall discuss the word appropriate in the emergency or non-urgent settings in the forthcoming lectures with its all dimensions, extensions, inclusions, exclusions. But in fact, a universal definition of health law doesn't exist. So don't waste your time on looking for it. Even in the Cornell Legal Information Institute or in Britannica, you cannot find a distinct description of health law. What you will need basically will say this. 
health law is the federal, state, and local law, rules, regulations, and other jurisprudence among providers, payers, and vendors to the healthcare industry and its patients, and delivery of healthcare services, all with an emphasis on operation, regulatory, and transactional legal issues. Now, let me give you a quick example regarding the difference between consumer, user, payer, and the patient. Where Medicaid or Medicare patient is hospitalized for inpatient care, let's say in a general hospital, she is the user of patient room or lab or the surgery theater or any other room in possession of the hospital where she is being examined or treated. The buyer of the rooms is her managing healthcare plan or program. In Georgia, for instance, it is pitch care, well care, etc. And the payer of the room is the government, Medicaid or Medicare. However, the consumer of healthcare services remains the patient. So are they all the government, the managing health plan, the patient, consumers of healthcare? Certainly not. Yet such definitions make the words user and consumer interchangeable and they discriminate neither. Next, the role of a provider is not properly defined. A healthcare provider can be a licensed professional, be that physician, PA, nurse, or midwife, doula, dietitian, optometrist, clinical psychologist, and so on. Can a pharmaceutical company or bioengineer medical device engineer or manufacturer of medical devices become a provider? Typically, the law of patient care does not recognize the pharma or medical device industries as healthcare providers because it relies on the concept of torts, which includes duty and relationship, standard of care, proximate cause of damage, and the transferred damage. And if you look at the relationship between the pharmaceutical company and the patient, some elements of prima facie showing of a tort are provable in terms of the side effects, but some aren't, like the duty or relationship. Then again, what is health law? It is hard to define because it is a broad legal concept dispersed onto multiple clusters of the law, torts, contracts, property, criminal law, environmental law, corporate and antitrust regulations, and so on. But mainly, we are dealing here with torts, because in the civil law, whatever has nothing to do with contractual disputes falls in the category of torts, pretty much. The majority of healthcare-related disputes are tort cases. You may find my slides a bit messy or too dense, uh, would it be a real-time presentation, I would make them simple, but as far as you can rewatch all this later, I try to condense the sections in lesser number of slides. So let's move on. The word tort has French roots and it means wrong. The easiest way to understand what tort is, is to define what it is not. Tort law operates in both civil and criminal justice. The key element for establishing liability or culpability is intent. Torts versus contracts. I created this original table to present the key elements and differences in between. In contract, tort is not a private cause. It is a failure to live up to legally imposed standards. In contract, the wrongdoing is defined by the persons. In torts, it is defined by the social norms. Therefore, tort is present in both civil law and criminal law. The skeleton on which the tort law is built is the concept of intent. In criminal law, we name it center, or the actor's state of mind, mens rea. The degrees and dimensions of the center are provided in the well-known model penal code. From the mild to severe, those grow from negligent, reckless, knowing, to purposely committed wrongful acts. An exception is the strict liability. 
The strict liability offenses have no intent element and there is no need for the jury to establish the state of mind to hold the wrongdoer as liable or culpable. You know that the intent must be established by the jury, not by the bench. The jury finds, the court rules. Strict liability is a modern statutory trend which abrogates the common law approach that behavior is only criminal when the defendant commits act with a guilty mind. Sometimes the rationale for strict liability crimes is the protection of the public interests, health, safety, welfare. Let's observe situations that fall under the strict liability doctrine. Child abuse or neglect is a strict liability. Navigating an airplane under the influence of drugs or alcohol is a strict liability. Now, does posing harm or actually harming a fetus amount to strict liability? For example, by smoking during pregnancy or driving and texting during pregnancy. Well, 27 states with fetal custody laws find this type of maternal fetal conflict as a strict liability. The liberal states find that it is not. The conservative states see the fetal abuse as a matter of public interest, and the liberal states count it as a private conflict that can be defended as a constitutional right. We shall discuss this later in the section concerning to maternal fetal conflicts. In healthcare settings, the strict liability may refer to examining or treating a patient without informed consent, or when provider is under the influence of alcohol or illicit drugs, or wrong blood transfusion, wrong site surgery, ignitive cases, sponge cases, abandoning the patient, etc. In the forthcoming lectures, we shall visit the Hans formula or the calculus of negligence to determine whether it does apply to malpractice causes of actions. We will discuss and exemplify defense strategies in malpractice lawsuits, in particular assumption of risk, professional disclosure doctrine, patient's reasonableness standard or Canterbury standard, carbside counsel, discovery rule, statutes of limitations, and survival statutes. But firstly, you must remember that while in general in torts law, a small percentage of crimes are crimes of omission or negligence. The majority of malpractice lawsuits are about the omission because here we have the duty element and the negligent act constitutes a failure to act when a duty or obligation is imposed. So, the strict liability offenses mandate a less severe punishment because the harm is not caused by in advance crafted strategy. Therefore, strict liability offenses mostly match to the degree of recklessness. And so, having that said, in health law we group the tort into three main categories. Intentional torts, negligent torts, strict liability. Because malpractice is tort, in order to succeed in prima facie showing of a medical malpractice, the plaintiff carries a burden to factually present all mandatory elements as we do in tort law, for example, in battery disputes. So here are the basic four elements of tort, which also apply to the malpractice law. Duty, breach of the standard of care, causation, and damage. In strict liability, having first two provable elements in prima facie case is enough to establish the guilt or the wrong. Speaking of duty as the first element in prima facie showing of a malpractice, we cite the following cornerstone decisions. I put those in the chronological order to show the evolution of the duty concept in medical law. There are two aspects of formation and termination of provider-patient relationship. Voluntary agreement and once created, the obligation becomes non-waivable. Such a voluntary relationship doctrine has sprung from Hurley and Infield. The court ruled that the physician had no duty to enter into a relationship with patient. It also set up that license permits but does not require provision of medical services, 
and physician cannot be forced to practice at all or on other terms that he may choose to accept. There are so named gray areas though, which include medical consultations between providers, we name it curbside, medical examinations performed for purposes unrelated to the patient's health care. It could be insurance, employment, or benefit eligibility determinations. In Turney versus University of Michigan Regents, physician of a high-risk pregnant with history of two miscarriages had canceled surgical procedure at last minute after learning about a conflict of relationships with his colleague. And so before the patient could find another provider, she suffered a miscarriage and sued to hold physician liable for abandonment because miscarriage was caused by the delay of medical care, as the physician had not given a timely notice of termination of care. One of the issues before the court was whether abandoning a patient is a separate cause of action. To answer, the court tried to establish on prima facie when does a provider-patient relationship exist? It established that such a relationship or liability exists when the physician runs diagnostics or provides treatment to the patient, relationship continues until spell of illness ends or either party terminates it. This relationship can be terminated only by a sufficient notice to the patient. It also ruled that there is no relationship when the physician holds informal conversation about general medical matters with the patient, schedules future appointments until the actual appointment. The common law, however, is unsettled in regards to the attitude for the attorney's court decision. In Reynolds v. Decatur Memorial Hospital, the Illinois case, the main issue was whether, as a matter of law, a telephone conference between treating pediatrician and a bystanding colleague concerning the patient's condition created a physician-patient relationship between the patient and the collateral or informal physician when the latter practiced in the same hospital where the patient received treatment. The disposition was that there was no provider-patient relationship between the curbside and the patient even though the patient, in this case it was a pediatric patient, had consented to screening and treatment in that particular hospital. However, in Dix versus Arizona cardiologists, the decision upon similar case was adverse. Here, the key was in misdiagnosis. The patient arrived to medical emergency and eventually died soon after. The ER physician consulted with the cardiologist Follow the latter's advice because the patient's ECG, or the German version EKG, showed minor myocardial infarction while the patient was suffering from pericarditis. The cardiologist relied on the ECG results presented by the ER doctor, suggested that there was no myocardial infarction and approved that the patient could be discharged. Three hours after, the patient died from the cardiopulmonary arrest. The cardiologist contended that he simply provided a professional counsel with a colleague and it did not establish a provider-patient relationship. The trial court ruled in his favor, but the Court of Appeals reversed, reasoning that the specialist knew the advice he was providing was likely to be relied on. The ER doctor led the expertise to make an independent diagnosis, and this fact was sufficient enough to create the duty clause for medical negligence action. The court held that although an express contractual physician-patient relationship clearly gives rise to a duty to the patient, the absence of such a relationship does not necessarily exclude a duty to the patient. Is this always so? If doctors are not confident with their own decisions, they usually consult with a colleague. So why Dick's court was different from the Reynolds? Well, in the later case, the pediatrician was consulting with a senior colleague because she was subordinating her decision or judgment or she was lacking in skills and knowledge. In the Reynolds case, the treating physician did not exercise independent judgment as to the patient's diagnosis. Rather, 
she subordinated her professional judgment to more supervisory doctor and therefore the latter carried duty within the carpside triangle. In Reed v. Boyarsky, a New Jersey case, the issue was whether a physician retained to perform a pre-employment physical exam has a non-delegable duty to inform the patient of a potentially serious medical condition. Here, plaintiff was an equipment operator who pursuant to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration regulations was required to undergo a pre-employment physical screening prior entering a job contract. The potential company had a contract with EMR company based in Georgia, which in turn had subcontracted with another company named Life Care Institute, located in New Jersey. The Georgia-based company's duty was to perform the X-ray. The New Jersey-based company's duty was to interpret the results and to report any abnormalities to EMR within 24 hours of the examination. The New Jersey's doctor revealed red and enlarged mediastinum in the patient's X-ray, indicative to an aggressive lymphoma. Yet he did not inform the Georgia-based company about the abnormal results. Year after, the patient died from stage 2B Hodgkin's disease at the age of 28. The wife brought a suit on behalf of the victim's estate, and the case was settled with the radiologist and EMR company. But the case against the other defendant, Life Care in New Jersey, went to trial. The New Jersey Supreme Court held that a physician who performs a pre-employment screening has a non-delegable duty to disclose to the examinee any life-threatening abnormality uncovered during the exam. In emergency care, there is also another factor that interferes with the concept of provider's duty and standards of care. Under the anti-discrimination law, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, which we know as EMTALA, which is a section of the 42nd U.S. Code, the following facilities, known as non-participating hospitals, have no obligations and can exercise the voluntary relationship doctrine. Hospital-based outpatient clinics not equipped to handle medical emergencies. Shriners Hospital for Disabled Children. Private clinics not designed for surgical or non-surgical emergencies. Restaurants, shops, or bookstores inside the campus. In-campus rooms for education, recreation, praying, or grievance. There is also a 250-acre rule, uh, which was coded after the Chicago incidents of 1998, and it reads, a person who presents anywhere on the hospital campus and requests emergency services must be handled under IMTALA. Other presentations outside the emergency room do not invoke IMTALA. IMTALA does not apply to any of off-campus facility, regardless of its provider-based status, unless it independently qualifies as a dedicated emergency department. You may ask now whether the voluntary relationship doctrine does exist in Canadian healthcare law. The informed consent doctrine is pretty much the same as in the States. It relies on the British law of torts. The consent can be expressed or implied, and most of the terms or definitions are similar to those in the United States, except of capacity versus competence. In the US, capacity stands for the mental or cognitive state, and competence stands for the legal age. It is usually above 18 years. In Canada, United Kingdom, or Australia, the usage of these terms is reversed. Competence refers to functional capacity, and capacity is about the legal age. In Canada, court awards are much lower than awards for similar injuries in the United States. Cases that might be successful in the U.S. are simply economically not feasible to pursue in Canada. Moreover, in Canada, most doctors are defended by a single non-profit organization called the Canadian Medical Protection Association, or CMPA the analog of the American Medical Association in the States, or AMA. There are more than 100,000 potential malpractice claims in Canada every year, but those only include deaths and injuries in hospitals. The statistics don't include negligent acts by non-urgent outpatient services. 
In other words, in Canada, the 99% of medical malpractice victims never even file a claim. Speaking of the voluntary relationship or help, you may have heard about the Good Samaritan laws. This is a common concept. However, it only implies but does not apply to the standards of care. In fact, the Good Samaritan laws are pro-provider, as long as the caregivers are acting in a voluntary manner without any expectation of reward, similar to the Bible story. Some laws still protect only medically trained rescuers, while others offer protection to any Good Samaritan. Alabama, for instance, restricts protection to trained rescuers or employees of the public education system unless the patient is suffering a cardiac arrest. That means any patient from a motor vehicle accident in the state of Alabama who isn't already dead won't be held by a lay rescuer unless that lay rescuer wants to take a chance on liability for any mistakes. Oklahoma's Good Samaritan Act only protects untrained rescuers if the care they provide is related to the CPR or controlling bleeding, a little better than Alabama's laws, but not much. All other states provide immunity if a person chooses to help, but do not require to aid the fellow humans in peril. The state of Vermont does, however. Its Good Samaritan law actually orders citizens to help those in need. What about the Hippocratic Oath, you may ask, the one that each and every medical graduate uses to sworn in? Written between circa 5th to 3rd centuries BC, it provided, I swear by Apollo Physician, Asclepius, Hygie, and Panacea, and all the gods and goddesses, making them my witnesses, that I will fulfill according to my ability and judgment this oath and this covenant. As you see, even in the 5th century BC, the language was so careful that it safe harbored a duty with covenants. You will read the rest, but I wanted to mention that this oath couldn't be more pristine and comprehensive as to its implications of moral, not legal issues. There is also a vigorous alternative, the oath or the charge of Maimonides, written in the 13th century by a Cordova, Spain, born Jewish physician and legal scholar who was practicing in Cairo, Egypt. So, Hippocraticos was prominent in the Greek and Roman law where ethics and law were united or cross-implied. The shaming and adjudication could often replace each other or merge. But not so in the Anglo-Saxon law, where ethics, doctrines, and the law are separated by two things, the subject matter and the technique. What about the ethics of medical care today? In its opinion, 8.11. The AMA Code of Medical Ethics stated that even the physicians are free to choose whom they will serve, they, however, have to respond to the best of their ability in cases of emergency where first aid is essential. As you see, the moral obligation, too, is reduced in reference to emergency care. Under this doctrine, the physician cannot be enforced by legal obligations. So there is a deviation between the ethical and legal rules in the Anglo-Saxon law. Taking the abortion debate alone, we see ethics and legal principles strikingly separated from each other. 41 states prohibit abortions, except when necessary to protect the woman's life or health after a specified point in pregnancy, most often fatal viability. 19 states have laws in effect that prohibit partial birth abortions. In three of these, Georgia, Montana, and New Mexico, laws apply only to post-viability abortions. Eight states restrict coverage of abortion in private insurance plans. 46 states allow individual healthcare providers to refuse to participate in an abortion, and 17 states mandate that women be given pre-abortion counseling. In the common law, the abortion debates are assessed through a number of hallmark precedents. It started from Griswold v. Connecticut, where the Supreme Court struck down a statute that criminalized contraceptive use and counseling. 
the court found that certain provisions of the Bill of Rights created a zone of privacy which protected the marital relationship and with which the state was barred for interfering. It held that the state's ban on the use of contraceptives violated the right to marital privacy under the protected prenumbra of specific guarantees of the Bill of Rights. Eisenstadt v. Baird extended the Griswold's holding to unmarried individuals. It established the right of unmarried people to possess contraception on the same basis as married couples. Eisenstadt involved a law criminalizing the distribution of contraceptives to single persons. The court extended the right of privacy to the individual, married or single, to be free from unwarranted intrusions into the matters fundamentally affecting a person as a decision whether to bear or beget a child. In fact, Griswold and Eisenstadt paved the way to Roe v. Wade, in which the court proposed a balancing test by holding that states could not completely ban non-therapeutic abortions. The same day as Roe v. Wade was adjudicated, a more lenient Georgia case, Doe v. Bolton, was heard by the Supreme Court, which reiterated the protection right to privacy. In 1989, both Roe and Doe were weakened by the Webster v. Reproductive Health Services, a Missouri case, when the court ruled that the trimester framework of Roe was unsound in principle and unworkable in practice. The Webster's court held that Missouri had an interest in protecting potential human life, which was furthered by requiring physicians to conduct viability tests on women seeking abortions when the physicians believed the fetus to be 20 weeks old. Webster is also important for what it didn't say. The plurality never characterized Missouri's interest in protecting fetal life as compelling, but only legitimate. This follows from the statement that the choice of whether or not to bear a child was only a liberty interest protected by the due process class. The conservatorship of Valer was about the procreative liberty of a developmentally disabled person. The issue was whether the conservator, the parent, had a constitutional right to have these decisions made for Valier in order to protect her interest in living the fullest and most rewarding life possible. The court concluded that the statutory prohibitions of sterilizations denied developmentally disabled persons privacy and liberty interests protected by the 14th Amendment. It held that the statute was constitutionally overbroad. Planned Parenthood versus Casey was the famous case much cited for the Justice Sandra O'Connor's magnificent words. Liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. Justice O'Connor had skillfully fixed a constitutional crisis linked to Roe v. Wade, the failing rational relationship test, by relying on the stare decisis instead of the main text of Roe v. Wade decision. The KC court held that the spousal awareness to obtain abortion was invalid under the 14th Amendment as it created an undue burden on married women who are seeking abortion. Then came Stenberg v. Carhart and struck down Nebraska statute of partial birth abortions, finding it as unconstitutional under the due process rights of the 14th Amendment. Gonzalez v. Carhart upheld the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act of 2003. Whole Woman Health v. Hellerstedt held that the state taxes cannot impose restrictions to abortion as it creates undue burden of women who otherwise travel to the neighboring New Mexico in seek of abortions. Garza v. Hargan, 2018 is a current case before the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit regarding an undocumented teenager, 17 years old, who had crossed the Mexican border and illegally entered the state taxes and is now in the custody of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Jane, the minor, seeks to have abortion at eight weeks of gestation. Yet, the Office of the Refugee Resettlement refuses to allow her to leave the shelter. The district court grants temporary restraining order to allow Jane seek a pre-abortion counseling by holding that the abortion is her constitutional right, 
even when her presence in the USA is illegal. The Supreme Court vacates the prior judgment and declares the case as moot. As you see, the legal debate over the abortion is not quite settled. Now, let's look at the ethics inquiry as to abortion. In the United States, it is mainly around the following three questions. When, if ever, is abortion morally permissible? Up to what stage of fetal development? For what reasons? In bioethics, three sets of views exist so far. Conservative, abortion is immoral at any stage for any reason. Liberal, abortion is permissible at any stage for any reason. And moderate, it's more complicated. What does it mean a viable fetus? It is the ability of the fetus to survive outside the womb. Often, there is a confusion that the viability can be measured by the biophysical profile. While it is true, the biophysical profile is measured only after the 30th week of pregnancy. The fetus becomes viable long before that. The biophysical profile is a quantitative test comprised of five components. Fetal heart rate, which is a non-stress test, breathing, movements, muscle tone, and the amniotic fluid index, where the sum of four quadrant vertical measures must be greater than one centimeter in two perpendicular planes. If the amniotic fluid is deficient, we name it oligohydramnios, the pocket between two perpendicular planes is less than 1 to 4 cm. In polyhydramnios, an excess of amniotic fluid, the largest pocket is greater than 8 cm in two perpendicular planes. In addition, viability is determined by Doppler, and one of the key measures is the systolic diastolic index of the uterine and fetal arcuate arteries which must be less than 2.6 after the 26th week. Often politicians do not know the details of quantitative clinical measures when they draft agendas or policies. It was in 1995 at the Fourth World Conference on Women where the gestational age determining the viability of fetus was shifted down from the 28th to the 22nd week. You may see the huge difference of the fetal sizes corresponding to those weeks. And so, such a shift did increase liability. A good number of researchers specialized in obstetrics, perinatology, or teratology, and legal scholars do not pay attention on the year of clinical observations to carefully distinguish or discriminate viability measures that are before and after the year of 1995. Now, let's draw the lines to determine the moral inquiry. In the abortion debate, the frequently posed question is, at what point in the continuous development does the fetus become human? Standard conservative approach, the fetus becomes human at the moment of conception. Standard liberal approach, the fetus remains non-human even in the later stages of development. The potential person argument suggests, through not fully a person, yet the fetus is a potential person. Moderation of the conservative view, even granting the fetus a personhood, a right to live, a right not to be killed, does not give the fetus a moral right to the use of the woman's body. Moderation of the liberal views, fetus has no moral status at any stage of pregnancy, nevertheless some abortions, especially in later stages, are immoral due to their negative social consequences. Callahan's approach suggests that the partial moral status confers a prima facie right to life, which may, nevertheless, be overridden by the woman's duties to herself, her family, and this society. Zinger's approach suggests that biological humanity carries no moral significance. Now let's see the measurable biological explanations of the fetal growth, the development of the fetal sensory nervous system including the brain. The process of gastrulation starts at the embryon days 14 and 15 and with the formation of a primitive strike of midline invagination as you see in the figure. The epiblast cells move through the strike. 
the bottom most layer becomes endoderm, the middle layer mesoderm, and the top layer ectoderm. These three layers will give rise to various parts of the developing embryo and to organ systems of the fetus, and this arrangement of three will remain the paradigm throughout the gestation to the human lifespan. As you see, the neural system at the early embryonal stages and in the form of neuroectoderm is generated from the external layer, the ectoderm. The ectoderm itself divides into three paroxysts, and the neural system generates from two of those. The central neural system, or the brain, the hindbrain, the spinal cord, and the retina of the eye originate from the neuroectoderm. The peripheral neural system, the neuroendocrine organs, form from the neural crest. Thus, the development of human brain is a protracted process that begins in the third gestational week with differentiation of the neural progenitor cell. Yes, indeed, the week four marks the closure of the neural tube, but week three is the onset of the neural plate development, which will then give rise to the spinal cord. Once again, the development of the human central nervous system starts from the third gestational week, well before the fetogenesis and placentation. Therefore, theoretically, the human embryo may sense at that early stage, and while we are able to somehow measure the sensory feedback, we won't be able to accurately interpret it. Two signaling molecules in the embryonal ectodermic paroxysts, EMX2 and PAX6, their reciprocal interaction and ratio play essential role in the early patterning of the presumptive neocortex. EMX2 and PAX6 are transcription factor proteins, the molecular products of the homonymous gene expression. These two signaling molecules are produced in opposite gradients along the anterior-posterior extent of the neocortical proliferative zone. The concentration of EMX2 is highest in the posterior and medial regions and lowest in the anterior lateral regions. PAX6 has the opposite expression pattern. High concentrations of PAX6 combined with low EMX2 induce progenitors to produce neurons appropriate for the motor cortex, or M1, while the reciprocal or reverse concentrations induce production of neurons for visual cortex, V1. At the intermediate levels of both factors, somatosensory cortices emerge. When EMX2 expression is blocked, visual areas shrink and somatosensory and motor areas enlarge. When PAX6 expression is blocked, visual areas enlarge, while somatosensory and motor areas shrink. The events of the antenatal period do serve to establish the core compartments of the developing nervous system from the spinal cord, the hindbrain, to the cortical structures of the telencephalon. These early events also provide initial patterning within each of the major subdivisions of the brain, but this early patterning in the narrow cortex is both underspecified and malleable. However, we can measure them, and they are the evidence since the embryonic development. Back to low. The next element of prima facie showing of malpractice is the standard of care. How do we measure it? Who sets up those standards for us? The most popular definition of the standard of care is provided in Ewing v. Good, the Ohio case, where the court clarified that the standard of care is a type and level of care an ordinary prudent healthcare professional with the same training and experience would provide under similar circumstances and in the same community. In malpractice law, it has four levels, just like the model panel code provides with the levels of intent. The rational care is the first level. Under the restatement second, the conflict of laws, Rule 145 is applied to determine circumstances per which the provider's conduct is tortuous, 
or how reasonable men would have conducted under similar or identical circumstances. General standard. This is left for the courts to decide. It is a common law rule assessing provider's negligence. If the scientific evidence provided by the expert witnesses, by the way, falls within the Federal Evidence Rule 901, it governs the normal standard for authentication. If a scientific theory qualifies as a readily verifiable certainty, the judge can establish the validity theory. Under the Federal Rule of Evidence 104, judge's decision is final. There is also a precise standard prescribed by the statute of ordinance and it decides whether the actor was negligent under the circumstances. In the interstate cases, the ordinance code or the common law rule will belong to the state where the injury occurred because of the tortious conduct. Strict liability. In the common law, this refers to the wrong acts regardless of the intent prescribed. No proof of fault is required. Remember, not always malpractice is negligence. Yes, the last thing a patient wants to know is that an error had occurred during the provision of care. However, while every error is malpractice because it is an error, not every error is negligence on the face of law. In order to succeed in negligence theory, the plaintiff carries the burden to prove that the provider deviated from the applicable standard of care. In order to achieve a better legal forum in aligning the standard of care with malpractice insurance that settles a well portion of cases before they would even reach the court, can we move the entire malpractice jurisdiction under the strict regulations of courts or statutes? In other words, can we criminalize the malpractice entirely? Ideally, if we would do so, then we had to assess the intent hierarchy the extent to which there was a harming aim, whether the imposed harm was purposely, knowingly, recklessly, or negligently. In most of malpractice cases, no provider intends to harm the patient. Not each and every error constitutes malpractice. Then what is a medical error? Put simply, medical error is a preventable mistake or an omission of reasonable aid on timely manner. Medical malpractice incorporates two basic types of providers' conduct, error and negligence per se. Quite often, the tort scholars mix the term medical negligence with medical malpractice. In fact, the negligence is a type of malpractice. The medical error can be a system error or a personal error. In either event, the most important difference between the error and negligence is that the medical error does not include the lowest degree of moral turpitude. Medical error can be technical and analytical. Strict liability cases can belong to either groups. For example, analytical errors that fall under the strict liability jurisprudence could be breach of the patient's privacy or abandonment of the patient. And errors that fall under the rational care standard could be misdiagnosis, wrong treatment, poor choice of the anesthesia method, drug administration errors, timing errors, or lack of professional vigor or poor rapport. The technical errors that fall under the strict liability jurisprudence could be the wrong side surgery, operating on the wrong patient, deficient blood bank or code blue package for the cardiac aid, or leaving instruments in the patient's body after the surgery, and technical errors that belong to the rational standard clause can include fatigue or burnout of the surgeon or surgical team, failure to measure the blood loss before, during, and after surgery. Negligence does not hold on premise of knowledge or awareness. It is an unintentional tort, a behavior that is unreasonably dangerous or careless. Thus, the negligent tort feaser cannot succeed on his absence of intent theory. Instead, he must succeed by proving that his driving was reasonable. And this type of torts apply to the medical malpractice jurisdiction. So, the remaining portion of malpractice cases 
that can be criminalized must have something to do with the strict liability in order to become a subject matter for the criminal statutes. In strict liability cases, no proof of fault is required. This is a very easy case, but the catch is that strict liability is a rare and extreme case. Such cases include the never events, a colloquial term applied to serious preventable and costly medical errors that should not happen at all, regardless the level of care. Such events or never events include the use of inherently dangerous device or product, using contaminated instruments, leaving an instrument or gas pad in the patient's body after the surgery, wrong side surgery, wrong blood transfusion. The never events belong to the strict liability group because the lack of skills or labs is so apparent within the comprehension of a layman that requires only common knowledge to understand or judge it, and therefore expert testimony is not required. The third element of prima facie showing of medical negligence is causation. We distinguish actual and proximate causes. The proximate cause is part of the actual cause. It is like the yolk in the egg. The actual cause can be remote or proximate. There can be multiple proximate causes, each of them serving as the basis for liability. The proximate cause is applied to those more or less undefined considerations which limit liability even where the fact of causation is clearly established. The issue of actual causation, or causation in fact, requires application of but-for test. But-for physician's breach of duty would the patient's injury still have occurred. In actual cause, the issue is whether a particular causal factor is sufficiently close or proximate to the injury to justify the imposition of liability. In proximate cause, the issue is whether defendant's liability directly reasons the foreseeable consequence. Put differently, in actual cause, but for defendant's negligence, accidents would not have occurred. In proximate cause, the causal contributions are not too remote to unjustified imposition of liability. Assessing causality in the law varies from assessing causality in clinical medicine. Here, the output of litigation is a determination that an exposure did or did not cause specific injuries in the plaintiff. Experts think of the risk as a probabilistic measure derived of the observations in a population or community. An example, if 600 pregnant women were exposed to carbimazole, about 27 children are expected to be born with facial anomalies, as statistically established risk is 4.5%. Out of these 27, three children may have other genetically transmitted congenital anomalies, tetrads, with 72 various ideological factors, and the other 24 children may have a teratogenic carbimazole-induced anomaly. In public health setting, it is easy to say that carbimazole causes facial defects in offspring because the risk of disorder is 11-fold higher in the population of exposed individuals. This is usually what the public health researchers do or say. In the courts of law, the scientist or the witness will not be required to determine that a child's facial abnormality was definitely caused by a teratogenic exposure. Absolute certainty is not anticipated. Courts require reasonable certainty or more likely above the 50% likelihood. In this particular example, if the scientist determines that the chance that congenital facial defects were caused by carbimazole was 88.9% or 24 out of 27, which is greater than 50%, then the court may conclude that carbimazole caused the child's facial malformations to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Conventionally, 
Experts follow Bradford Hill's criteria to assess causality in medical torts. These are nine principles established by an English epidemiologist Sir Austin Bradford Hill. The first criterion is strength or the effect size. A small association does not mean that there is no causal effect, though the larger the association, the more likely that there is a causal connection. Consistency or reproducibility. Consistent findings observed by different persons in different places with different samples strengthens the likelihood of an effect. Specificity. Causation is likely if there is a very specific population at a specific site in disease with no other likely explanation. Put in biostatistic terms, specificity is the fraction where the numerator is the true negative result and the denominator is the sum of the true negative and false positive results. In other words, Specificity is the ability of a test to correctly identify the non-affected samples. Thus, while sensitivity rules out the disease or cause, specificity rules in the disease or cause. We will have a separate lecture on biostatistics. Temporality. The effect has to occur after the cause. And if there is an expected delay between the cause and effect, the effect must occur after the delay. Biological gradient. Greater exposure should generally lead to greater incidence of the effect. However, in some cases, an inverse proportion is observed where greater exposure leads to lower incidence. Plausibility. A plausible mechanism between cause and effect is helpful but limited by current knowledge. Coherence. Coherence between epidemiological and laboratory findings increases the likelihood of an effect. Yet, lack of knowledge does not nullify the theory. Experiment. Occasionally, it is possible to appeal to experimental evidence. And the last criterion is analogy, where the effect of similar factors may be considered. Assumption of risk falls in the causality clause and can be used as a defense strategy. The risk of damage can be expressed or implied. Expressed is a written waiver of liability or a covenant not to sue. This type is uncommon in medical practice. However, the hospitals, not the physicians, may ask the patient to release liability for the falls and accidents or contraction of airborne infections deleterious to the fetus. Whether such a waiver will be enforced depends largely on jurisdiction and circumstances. In denying a release of liability or waiving the liability, the courts reason that the waiver is contrary to the public policy. The other is implied liability, which has two types. Primary assumption of risk, when a person in full awareness of danger cannot recover damages under this theory. Secondary assumption of risk, when plenty was hesitant of danger, yet did not avoid it when there was an alternative. Can implied or secondary assumption of risk bar recovery if contributory negligence has been replaced with comparative fault? The Carolinas, North and South, agree with this approach. In Rhode Island, plaintiff's assumption of risk is an absolute bar to recovery. In the majority of states, secondary implied assumption of risk is compared against the defendant's negligence. Now, risk disclosure is another sub-element of causality used in defense. The informed consent defense relies on two standards. Professional disclosure standard, as set in two California cases, Cobbs v. Grant and Tarasov v. Regents of University of California, which addresses the following inquiry. What a reasonable practitioner would have disclosed under similar circumstances? Observe the carefully chosen word similar, not identical. Similar circumstances, not identical. Under this jurisdiction, the jury is required to establish whether the disclosure standard was met, regardless what other practitioners would reasonably do. 
If certain information is not customarily disclosed in medical community, the jury is required to find for defendant. Also, a peer witness testimony is required. The other is patient's reasonableness standard, or Canterbury standard, established in Canterbury v. Spence, the DC Appeals Court. The inquiry is, what a reasonable patient would consider material to making an informed decision? This standard gives the jury freedom in making a determination that failure to disclose amounts liability, regardless of what is the customary standard in that medical community. Under this standard, expert testimony is not required. Obviously, the Canterbury standard is more favoring the plaintiff. Canterbury Court has also established standards measuring performance of duty of disclosure. It is unrealistic to expect doctors to discuss with patients every risk of the proposed treatment. A risk is material when a reasonable person in what the doctor knows or should know to be the patient's position, would be likely to attach significance to the risk in deciding whether or not to forego the proposed therapy. A doctor bears no responsibility for the discussion of hazards the patient has already discovered. When a genuine emergency arises, the impracticality of conferring to the patient dispenses a need for it. A doctor does not have to disclose the risk of treatment if the disclosure would make the patient become ill or emotionally distraught. The TOR's jurisdiction has contributed to comparative fault systems that are said to operate where defense takes the opportunity to reason why the plaintiff's proposed amount of recovery must be barred or adjusted. In other words, to rely on plaintiff's own negligence and mental competence. Contributory fault is any amount of negligence by the plaintiff which is a complete bar to recovery in most of the cases. In pure contributory negligence systems, defendant's liability, reduced by the percentage of injury, is attributable to negligence, where the plaintiff contributed to the 90% of damage and only 10% was imposed by defendant, plaintiff still can recover for that 10%. 13 states utilize this system. Comparative fault ensures that plaintiff fully or partially recovers for damages, even if plaintiff too was negligent. Plaintiff's negligence does not constitute an absolute bar to recovery. Instead, the monetary reward is reduced or adjusted. If 51% of the jury believes the cause, plaintiff wins. If the jury is split on 50-50%, plaintiff must establish more likelihood standards. The recovery is 100% for damages if 51% of the jury believes plaintiff's theory. If only 49% of the jury agrees, plaintiff gets nothing. Comparative fault system has gradual applications. In the pure comparative fault system, negligent plaintiff can recover from defendant only when his share of fault is less than 50%. If plaintiff's contributory fault is 40% and defendant's is 60%, plaintiff recovers at 60%. 21 states follow the 51 bar rule under which a damaged party cannot recover if it's 51% or more at fault. Modified comparative fault or proportionate responsibility is the 50% bar rule. Where there is a 50-50% negligence, plaintiff gets 50% recovery. 12 states follow this rule. In joint liability system, multiple defendants, providers, regents, hospital, curbside are involved. Plaintiff can recover any portion of total damages from any of defendants until the 100% of damages are recovered. Lastly, Negligence per se refers to imposition of liability without a proof of fault. To successfully invoke it, plaintiff must show that there is no evidence of the actual cause of injury, or the injury is not the kind that ordinarily occurs in the absence of negligence, or the injury could not have been caused by any instrumentality other than that over which the defendant had control. The last element you need to show to succeed in malpractice claim is damage. 
I'm sure you do understand that damage must be shown by facts, not by stories or speculations. Remember, the word damages, the plural, is not the plural of damage. It actually has a different meaning. Damage means loss or injury to a person or property. It is an uncountable singular noun and has no plural form. Basically, it's about the loss, trauma, injury. Damages, plural, means money claimed by or ordered to be paid to a person as compensation for the loss or injury. It is an uncountable plural noun and has no singular form. Therefore, damages, plural, is about recovery. There are several categories of damages. Special damages cover the quantifiable expenses caused by malpractice, including the medical bills and the past missed work. Expert witnesses are also required to estimate the special need expenses, mostly in teratology torts. Punitive damages. In strict liability cases, the imposed rule varies from state to state, but the general requirement is the presence of intent. The exact amount of punitive damages is up to the jury, but typically cannot be more than 10 times the amount of special and general damages. In states without statutory limits on punitive damages, judges decide the amount. When it comes to punitive damages, Malpractice law is full of controversies. Medical negligence suits increase the cost of malpractice insurance for the doctors and the hospitals. Consequently, the cost of treatment and therefore health insurance premiums increase. Remember that statutory limitations apply. Many states place a cap on the maximum amount of damages the patient can recover. Some states put a cap on all damages combined, saying a patient cannot recover more than, for example, $500,000. Others have a cap on only general damages, also known as non-economic damages, as usually those can be measured by a dollar amount. For example, California sets a 250000 limit on non-economic damages in medical malpractice cases. But there is no limit on economic damages, including compensation for past and future medical care, loss of past earnings, and diminished future earning capacity. Several statutes come to help measure the damage. Survival statutes allow the estate or heir to recover damages that occurred during the time period from initial malpractice to death of the patient. These damages generally include everything allowed in a malpractice suit had the patient survived, except for damages related to the future, like earning capacity. Wrong death statutes are designed to compensate patient's family for their future monetary loss. Compensation for loss of companionship or emotional harm is typically not allowed under the wrongful death statute, although some states allow that kind of recovery. Depending on the state, not all family members can recover. Pure economic loss refers to the unplanned and unexpected monetary losses that either the patient or the provider have suffered during the treatment process. The pure economic loss rule applies by showing privity. In order to succeed under the pure economic loss doctrine, plaintiff, be that the patient or the provider or the hospital, must prove a much closer relationship with defendant than he or she would have to prove in a claim for physical damage. Where there is pure economic loss, recovery incurred from the tort of negligence is very limited. And this was pretty much about the skeleton of a medical malpractice suit. In future, I will have lectures in clinical medicine, but as for the health law series, I will discuss surgical negligence cases with detailed observations of the technical pitfalls. I will also present on the compliance laws, which belong to the 42nd U.S. Codes, the Stark Law and Anti-Kickback Statute, and to the 31st U.S. Code, the False Claim Act, or otherwise known as the Lincoln Law. 
I will have a detailed and comprehensive discussion of the intellectual property law in healthcare settings, specifically on patents, trademarks, and unfair competition. We will have discussions on biotechnology law with the emphasis on the common rule, its instruments and principles mostly governed by the 21st U.S. Court. We will include the Bildol Act or the stevenson Widler Technology Innovation Act, both signed into law by President Jimmy Carter and both bound to regulate the innovation to technology transfer and licensing, patenting the innovations, as well as the flow of funds between the federal lab and industry. We certainly will have lectures about the governing laws in the organ or tissue transplantation industry. In particular, we will discuss my topic of interest, the techno-born organs, a term which I named, or TBO in abbreviation. I have a published article on this issue with Journal of the Knowledge Economy, Springer, and in my lectures, I will discuss how rejoining of the NSF and NIH to the Coordination Committee would help expand the regulations to assess scientific novelty and upstream in the organ creation. I will list the potential legal issues, in my view, that include the TBO patentability or the organ recipient's substantive due process rights of bodily integrity under the 14th Amendment and the acquired TBO ownership, as well as the advanced directives for autopsy on the TBO carrier and the extent to which an invention could be published, which is the shared property between the scientist and the organ recipient. Finally, we will have lectures in health economy, with the emphasis on healthcare value, something that remains largely unmeasured and misunderstood. In any field of market-based economy, value is defined around the customer, not the supplier. And health value, as a product, empirically is a fraction, a ratio between the healthcare outcome and the dollar spent, and is the amount for which something can be sold per time unit. Value is the outcome relative to the costs, and therefore it encompasses efficiency and quality. Also, in the market economy, choice architecture cannot be avoided. Here, the customer faces the burden of a comparative efficiency analysis in choosing a provider. In this context, ethical abstractions such as comfort, privacy, manipulations can create serious confusions. To make a progress, those abstractions must be brought into contact with the concrete practices. So, can we value healthcare value? The common economist approach is to model the maximum attainable outcome from a health system as a production function and to consider inefficiency as the extent to which the achieved outcome falls short of that idea. Since in market-based economy, value depends on the results and not on contributions, Healthcare value is measured not by the volume of services delivered. The outcomes, the numerator, as you remember from the fraction, are inherently condition-specific and multidimensional, as no single outcome captures the results of care. However, cost, the denominator, refers to the total costs of the full cycle of care for the patient's medical condition, not the cost of individual services. Therefore, in a capitalistic health market, in order to reduce the cost, the best approach is to spend more on certain services to reduce the need for others. Structurally, too, the current cost measurement approaches obscure value in healthcare, leading to cost containment efforts that are incremental and sometimes even counterproductive. The market-based healthcare makes it challenging even for measuring the value. Most providers tend to measure only what they directly control and what is easily measured. And the current reimbursement practices are misaligned with the value. So, can we increase the healthcare value and how? One approach is to reduce the cost. If a surgery would cost 5000 instead of 50000 
not only it would increase the healthcare value, but also would solve multiple other problems, such as the provider-patient ratio, better health promotion and preventive care, as more customers will be involved because the costs are lower. The lower cost would help timely diagnose certain diseases, which would ensure better management of those diseases. Also, the number of the physician's false claims for Medicaid reimbursements for services not provided would decrease because the amount sought to defraud the government would be reasonably low to take a risk for it. These are pretty much equations to be addressed in a more organized and scrutinized way in the upcoming lectures. In conclusion, let me open up that I was viciously libeled by cognitively and mentally retarded people, animals, I would say, and that kept me unemployed for nine years. Nine years from now. My name is Black Flagged. I certainly have conducted consulting services for various agencies, have written books for small royalties, but I look for a full-time job where even you win in a libel court case. After mass, you still need to smooth your path by yourself. Courts are not going to do that for you. Quite often, the defamation lawyers collaborate themselves with the hate sites that possess the damaging information about you. So that's the evil dark enterprise. That's the underworld. This is a free speech country with dysfunctional filters that would separate the true speech from a moronic lie. And when an untrue negative information is spread like a viral airborne infection, it captures the people's minds as an epidemic, easily, rapidly, and forever. And so, I am a United States citizen, but I do not mind working in Canada or Europe. My law school is in the United States, but I also have familiarity with the concept in Europe, as I have taken several training programs in health law in Central Europe. Here, I included a list of law schools in the United States, Canada and Europe and would be happy to serve as a member of either academic community. Those who can help me surpass the workforce black door and email me about the current open positions of a health law instructor or professor at the universities as listed herein would have done an act of conscience and kindness. Thanks for watching.